Hello, so welcome to Make Your Wildlife Observations Count webinar one, which is going to focus on how to record. Uh, my name's Kieran Brown, and uh, in my spare time, I run the National Earthworm Recording Scheme. So biological recording is something that I'm really passionate about. It's also what I do in my day job with the Field Studies Council. I run a project that's all about teaching people to identify and record uh, under-recorded groups of invertebrates. So that's a little bit about me. Um, what we're going to do today, so this is the first of two webinars. The next webinar will be uh, on Saturday the 29th. Uh, in this webinar, we'll be covering the basics of a biological record. So what is a biological record? And then we're going to talk about some of the, the concepts around biological records. So record resolution. So that's how fine the detail is within the record and data quality and then we're finally going to round it off with sharing records so how you submit your records etc so the basics any uh, biological recording is the scientific study of the distribution of living organisms and biological records describe the presence abundance associations and changes both in time and space of wildlife so Another term for biological record is a species occurrence record. So when you hear, hear either of those terms, they essentially mean the same thing. Um, any biological record is made up of four basic components. And without each of these components, the record can't be accepted. So first is the who. And, and this is the thing that people can quite often forget that they, they are a part of that record. So the observer, the recorder, the determiner, that is a part of the record. Um, the what? So obviously you can't have a species occurrence record or a biodiversity record without knowing what you're talking about. So the what is ideally a species, but it, it can be uh, a family or, or, or even broader than that. Where? So the where is the location that the observation was made. So if you find a shell on a beach, then it's where you found that shell. Um, the when is a point in time, so that adds the temporal data to the record. So if we look at a very basic biological record, let's say that I'm the observer, I've seen, I'm the recorder, I've seen uh, an animal at a certain place at a certain time, and that was a red fox, and it was in my parents' garden uh, up in Cumbria, uh, and on the 15th of July, 2010. And what you'll notice there for the where, I've given uh, what we call a, a OSGB grid reference. So it's a grid reference rather than just a postcode or name of a site. And I'll go into a bit more detail about grid references later on in this webinar, and we'll explain what the problems are with not giving a good reference in the second webinar. So all four of those components together make up the biological record. It is not a biological record if it's missing any of those components. I'm not going to go through the who or the when in any more detail because they are quite simple. Uh, it's the name of the person that's making the record. It's ideally the date when the record was made. But I'm going to go a little bit more detail into the what and the where just to make sure that we're all on the same page about uh, what these components are and how we can best record them. So with the what, I think we need to maybe just mention uh, species names. So the there are both what we call common names and scientific names for many organisms. Some just have a scientific name, but many have common names as well. Using common names when you're biological recording can lead to a few issues, a few little problems. So it's always best if you are submitting a record to make sure that you submit the scientific name alongside the common name. And you, you can usually find this out pretty easily by, by searching on the internet, etc. And I've just given a very simple example here. This is what we all know as a hedgehog. Um, and most people will call it a hedgehog. It's also known as the European hedgehog, because when we look at a, a global scale, there are different species of hedgehog. 
Uh, and it's also known as the West European Hedgehog or the Common Hedgehog. Uh, and this is, this shows you that there can be a little bit of variation in what the common names are. And common names can also be misleading. So it's called the Common Hedgehog. It's no longer common in the UK. It, it's actually, um, it's actually at risk of extinction. It's not doing well at all. So common names can be a little bit misleading sometimes with what they mean, but there's also quite often a lot of variation regionally over time about what people call things as well. And uh, some people refer to hedgehogs as urchins. Now, to me, an urchin is an invertebrate that you find in the sea, a, a spiky ball. Um, and there are some other um, strange and weird, weird and wonderful names I found for hedgehogs there as well. And to make sure that we know what people are talking about when they're submitting a record, it's always good to have the scientific name. Uh, with some groups, scientific names are well established, but, but not with all. So let's have a look at another one. The daddy long legs. So the term daddy long legs. What I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly launch a poll and I would like to know um, which of these you think is a daddy long legs. So you, you, can, you should be able to move the poll around if it's in front of the images, but you've got Three images there, one, two, three. Is image one a daddy long legs? Image two, image three. Images one and three are all three images. Uh, it's anonymous, I can't see who's voted for what, I can just see the proportions. So I'll give, you, I'll give you a couple of seconds to fill that in and have a sip of my tea. Right, this is really interesting. Okay. Oh. Uh, bear with me, somebody's annotated the slide, I need to see if I can get that off. Just give you a couple more seconds to get that in. Sorry, there, there is somebody there that is adding annotations to the screen, if you, if you could just avoid doing that. Um, it might just be here. Sorry. Right, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and reshare to get rid of those annotations. All right, okay. All right, I'm going to share the results. So, 71% of you went for one only, which one is a crane fly, belongs to the family. That one, that image is from the family Tipulidae, and they are commonly known as daddy long legs quite often as well. It doesn't refer to a species, it refers to the whole group. Number two is a species called Fulcus phalangioides, uh, otherwise known as a cellar spider, and otherwise known as a daddy long legs spider as well. So if we're recording a daddy long legs, perhaps it could refer to the daddy long legs spider. Uh, and only 4% only of you would, would have called that a daddy, daddy long legs. Image three is a harvestman, so this is an order, like spiders is, a, is an order, uh, apiliones. So these are long-legged arachnids that you find, um, you find in long grass, etc. sometimes in leaf litter. And they're also known sometimes as daddy long legs as well by people. So if you put all three, you were, you were technically correct. Now, it's interesting to me that 71% have went for one only. And that could be that regionally you wouldn't call uh, harvestmen daddy long legs. I don't know. I don't know. It, it, sometimes it's quite hard to tell how regional these things. What I can tell you is that the harvestmen up in Cumbria, we would definitely, uh, we referred to them as daddy long legs as well. So, yeah, really interesting and just shows there that the, there can be confusion if scientific names are not presented alongside the common name. Right, so good references. Uh, I've got another little quiz for you here. Sorry, I'm keeping you on your toes because I'm aware it's lunch, so I don't want everybody sneaking off. I would like somebody to drop in the chat um, what they think letter a the two the two letters in the yellow box labeled a 
what that refers to in a grid reference. So the grid reference we've got in front of us is a six figure grid reference. Um, if somebody can drop in the chat what they what they believe that is that refers to. I've got any. Uh, so Giselle said, Giselle said an OS map reference. It, it is to do with that, but do you know what specifically within an OS map the two letters refer to? Region, not quite, Tracy. The major grid square. Yeah, Karen, in a sense, yeah. What they refer to is a specific 100 kilometer square. Yeah, Judith got there just as I was saying it. So yeah, it's a hundred kilometer square. So each of the squares on that map to the left with the with the letters, so the letters refer to that square, uh, are a hundred kilometers by a hundred kilometers. Right, B, the light green box. Does anybody want to tell me what those three numbers, 441, refer to? Yeah, Judy's straight in there again, Eastings, yeah. So these are the X coordinates. So uh, these refer to what we know as the Eastings. Now, the way I always remember it is I think of them as the x-coordinates, because if you think when you're graphing so something, the x-axis is along the bottom and the y-axis is along the top. And that makes it easy for me to remember what, what these are referring to. So uh, basically, that, that 100 kilometer square of SO can be broken up into one kilometer squares, which can be broken up into 100 meter squares, which can be broken up into 10 meter squares to one meter squares, etc. And those numbers tell us which square that's referring to. So a grid reference does not refer to a point on a map, it refers to a square. And the longer the grid reference, the smaller the square. Right, this should be an easy one. What about C? Anybody want to drop in the chat what C refers to? If B is the Eastings, what do we think that C is? The Y coordinates are Northings, exactly. Perfect. Um, what's important to get across here is that, that you've got these three blocks. And as a grid reference grows in size or shortens in size, it's always the first half of the numbers versus the second half of the numbers at the x versus y coordinates. Um, so you're not adding numbers onto the end or taking numbers off the end. And we'll go through shortening grid references in more detail in the second webinar. OK, right. So now we know what the different components of a grid reference are. I'd like to just show how grid references work on a map. So we're going to move from that grid square. and We're going to look at grid square SP because that contains part of Buckinghamshire, and that's what we're here to learn about recording wildlife in Buckinghamshire. So SP, if we look at that in a bit more detail, we can see there it, it contains uh, parts of Oxfordshire, uh, parts of East Worcestershire, Warwickshire, Northamptonshire, etc. And if we look at that in a bit more detail, so we zoom in a bit, we can divide that into more grid squares. So we can divide it up evenly, and when we do that, and we take one of those smaller grid squares, we've then got a, so that's a 100 kilometer grid square, we've then got a 10 kilometer grid square at the bottom. And that grid square would re be referred to as SP00, because it's in the very bottom left corner. So the X coordinate is zero and the Y coordinate is zero. So you're always taking your X and Y coordinates from the bottom left hand of the square. So this square is SP and this square is SP00. So if we take that one and zoom in, we can see that that divides up uh, into smaller squares. And I've highlighted a square here so that we're not just in the bottom left corner again. Uh, but this whole square is still SP00. Uh, just zoomed in. Um, and if we look, we can see if we add in the specific grid references for these squares, we can see here that 
the first two digits don't change because the X coordinates don't change. It's only the Y coordinates that change with each grid square as you go up. So it goes from zero to nine um, for grid square SP zero zero. And then along the bottom, uh, similar, similarly, the it's only the first half of the digits that change uh, because the Y coordinate is remaining at zero. So if we want to figure out where if we say I've I, I want to get the grid reference for a specific location in Barnsley Wood there in that grid square, uh, that would if we go up and across, we get it's SP06 and 07. And if we look around that grid square, we can see the grid squares around it, how they relate and how the numbers are different. So hopefully that gives people a bit of a better explanation of, of how these grid squares work and, and what neighboring grid squares would look like. And again, we can zoom into that. And if we say that I was at the location I'm specifically looking for is a corner of this path, again, we can, we can make the grid reference even more precise, finer detail and add in two extra, two extra numbers. So that would be the seven for the X coordinate and the two for the Y. So seven across, two up. Okay. Hopefully that covers grid references in enough detail uh, for this webinar. I won't bore you all with grid references all day. And now I'm going to move on to record resolution. So now we know that we need the four basic components to get a biological record. And we've got, um, and we've went into a bit of detail about making sure that we're using scientific names for species names and we know how good references work we can look at those the the resolution of the record so this is the level of detail contained within the biological record the higher resolution the more precise the record so as an example a record specific to a date has a higher resolution than a record specific to a year so higher means finer detail um Okay, so we've got these four components of the biological record, and each of those specific components can be high or low resolution. So you can have something that has a high resolution location and a low resolution uh, when component. So if we go through them one by one, if we look at the who, uh, high resolution data would give us the details of the person that made the observation or took the photo and the, the name of the person that determined the species. Now, they're quite often the same person, um, but not always. Uh, you might have collected a spider and give it or given it to somebody, or you might have shared a photo on social media that somebody helped you identify. Low resolution, low resolution data would be like an organization or a group or something like that. And it's low resolution because it makes it harder for us to, to go back and uh, really analyze the reliability of the data. It makes it more difficult to contact the person that was involved in creating the record. For the what, a high resolution, high resolution data would be species level identification. And then the lower the taxonomic level that it was um, identified to, the lower the resolution. So for example, a record of a B, um, for, which is yeah essentially family level. That wouldn't that wouldn't be very useful. It would be very low resolution resolution data. You can get even higher resolution than species. Um, you can actually use genetics or uh, tracking, etc. Trackers, etc. Uh, tagging to to even go to the individual. So. Um, you can get even higher resolution than species level as well. The where, I mean, this, this is quite simple to understand because it is very quantitative. The higher the resolution, the finer the geographic location that we're getting, so that the smaller that grid square we've got. And I mean, you could theoretically record to a micromillimeter but higher resolution isn't always better. So the resolution of a record should be 
to the level that you can do it most accurately. So recording something to the nearest micromillimeter is not useful if you're recording a fox at all, uh, because they're bigger than that. Uh, in fact, that's probably that level of detail is never going to be needed for anything. Uh, and it would be extremely difficult to get a grid reference that, that is that accurate. So it's just something to be aware of, because one of the mistakes that I see a lot is people think the more precise the grid reference, the better. That's only true as long as it's accurate. And it can vary depending on things like how mobile or big the species is as well. Um, when, uh, again, this is quite um, quant uh, quantitative, the higher the resolution, a full date is fine. You can make that even more specific by putting in the time. Uh, that might be useful for some things, less useful for others. So it depends on the ecology and behavior of the organism, whether uh, you need to be recording, whether it's out during daylight or on uh, evening hours. So, right. OK, so that's how that works. With a summary, we can see there that records can have varying, varying resolution across the four different components. So a record can be high resolution for some components and low resolution for others. Generally, we want to go for high resolution data, but we need to be aware, particularly with grid references and with identification, um, that we're only recording to as high a resolution as we can be confident. So if we take an example of a, a really low resolution record, uh, let's say the Friends of Darwin course have recorded a ladybird uh, within a 10 kilometer grid square in 2016. In terms of what we can do with that data, there's very little. Uh, we can't go back to the recorder very easily to, to get further information because we we just have the name of an organization. We don't know who actually saw that ladybird. We've only got it to family level and different ladybird species have different ecologies, different behaviors. If we want to look at the impact of harlequins on native species, then this would be no good whatsoever. 10 kilometer grid square is not ideal. We can't match that to habitat or anything like that. Uh, it might be usable at national distribution mapping level, but that would be about it. And because we've only got it to family level, it only tells us whether ladybirds are present or not in that 10 kilometer square, which to be honest, we would have known anyway. Um, that's not going to tell us anything new. And yeah, uh, means that we lose any seasonal information, um, things like time of emergence for things like moths, um, butterflies, etc. So not great. We can make this a little bit more useful by adding in the recorder who we can go to for more information. Uh, the genus gives us a little bit more definition about the ecology of, of whatever was recorded. Uh, we've got a bit of a finer grid square there and a bit finer detail tempor temporarily uh, by adding in the month. But ideally what we would like is knowing who saw and who ID'd the organism that was spotted, uh, the species name, um, both we've got there the scientific name as well as the common name, just to avoid confusion. 100 meter by 100 grid meter, 100 meter by 100 meter grid square, that's fine enough detail for, for a flying insect and the full date. So with that 100 by 100 meter, we can probably narrow it down to habitat as well. Uh, full date tells us exactly the time of year that this, this organism was active. So now we know what a high resolution record is, what a low resolution record is. We can make sure that we're recording to as high resolution as we are confident with. Okay, so the second concept that I wanted to introduce was data quality. So data quality is a state of qualitative or quantitative pieces of information. There are many definitions of data quality, but data is generally considered high quality if it is fit for its intended uses in operations, decision making and planning. So 
the important thing to take away from that is the quality, the data quality for a record is directly related to what it is going to be used for. Uh, and you might not want to know what it's going to be used for, but you know why you're doing your recording, what you may want it to be used for. So although we, rec we can record absolutely everything about um, a species observation, that, that could end up needing lots of equipment and, and needing lots of expertise, etc. So we, we want to be selective about what we record, but get the best information for the intended use of the data. So to put that in uh, context of our biological records, we've got our four components here. And one way we can improve the quality of this data, so we've talked about resolution, but adding in data quality as well is by adding in extra information about the who, what, where, when. So for the who, we could make sure that we've got in, like I've said previously, the recorder and the determiner, but also maybe the verifier, if somebody checked the record and said that they agree that this is correct. We can add in other information about the species that was observed. So for example, the life stage is quite often really useful. The sex, where relevant, uh, really useful. Uh, abundance, so how many were seen as well. This all adds more context to the ecology of the organism that we're recording. Uh, where, so we really need a grid reference. But a site name is really useful as well, because that can be cross referenced with the grid reference on a map to make sure that it's in the same place. Uh, it also tells us, it might tell us more about where in that square and what habitat the um, organism was found in. Vice County is useful, so I'm not going to go into Vice Counties in detail, but Vice Counties are a system that we have in biological recording uh, that ignore the ever changing. Uh, political boundaries of counties uh, and it helps us standardize where we're recording things but it's quite often how recording groups are divided up so knowing what vice county something is is in quite often means we know who to send that data to for checking things like altitude can be really useful as well um, and then with when we could add in time we could add in whether it's day or night we could add in the season however something i want to stress here is that you don't need to put everything in every record and there are a few examples in there that are, are not really necessary so altitude and season are probably not necessary because we can get that from the grid reference and from the date so although there is extra information that can add to the quality of the data we don't need to ask for everything from everybody because we, we can quite often there are certain things that we can we can get through other means if they're needed. The who, what, where, when, though, are not the only components that we can have in a record. So there are two non-essential extra bits of information, two components that we can add in as well. And they are the how, so how the record was generated. And they quite often are asking things about the, the how components are about contextualizing the record uh, and why why is that species there so this might be adding behaviors in it might be adding adding in uh, things about the habitat etc so just to give some examples there with the how we might add in things like the survey method that was using the amount of time spent surveying numbers of survey we might add in the recorder experience all of these things help us standardize uh, our biological records and they help us when comparing one biological record to another. So we can start doing a lot more with the data when records are comparable with one another. And the why, that helps us understand a lot more about the species records. So we know that something is there on a certain, uh, at a certain time, in a certain place, certain species recorded by a certain person, but knowing things like habitat, micro habitat, uh, whether they really help us understand what is going on with these species as well. And which of these components you record will depend on what you're recording for. And 
this list can be could be endless. <laughs> um, one thing I would advise is when you are making biological records, any supplementary information you can you can give, then do add that. So the comments box on a biological record is your best friend. Add in whatever context you've got there, because that helps with verifiers to establish whether they can accept the record or not. And you can see here a photo of an orange tip. You don't need to be a professional wildlife photographer to submit records of biodiversity. Depending on the species, uh, a blurry photo might be fine. A blurry photo of a hedgehog still enables somebody to verify that it, it is a hedgehog, whereas a blurry photo of a bat won't help at all with narrowing it down to species. But submitting your photos, if you've got them, it can only help. So don't worry if they're terrible. My photos are always terrible, um, but sometimes they're enough to help. Right, okay, I'm just gonna end the presentation component with sharing records. So in Buckinghamshire, there are two ways really that you can submit your data to, uh, to the record center. And I'm gonna go through them in a little bit, but first of all, I just wanna contextualize who might want your data. So I've broke it, broken down who might want your data into four groups. Now there are many more potential users of your data, but in terms of taking your data and curating it and compiling it into data sets, these are probably the four main groups. So the first is your local environmental record centre. So in Buckinghamshire, this is Buckinghamshire and Milton Keynes Environmental Record Centre. And what they do is they take in biological records, they curate them. They work with a network of local groups and county recorders. They verify what data they can and they will make that data available uh, through services to local services. So, for example, when ecologists need to do a planning search for development, they'll go to the local environmental record centre to use it. Uh, the Wildlife Trust will work with the local record centre to um, look at how, look at their uh, local uh, nature conservation plans, etc. So, they are looking after data on a on a local slash regional um, basis. You've also got local natural history groups. Now they quite often have links with the record center, but not always. So it's always worth checking what you want your data to be used for and checking where you can, where and who you need to submit it to. Um, local natural history groups can include all sorts of things from back groups to uh, friends of groups. Yeah, they can, they can focus on something quite specific like barn owls in this example here, or they can focus on all wildlife and, and just on a site. So they can be really variable. And for a long time, they've been the real linchpin of, of biological recording because this is how a lot of people get involved in biological recording in the first place. You've then got the National Recording Schemes and Societies. So these are the organisations, and I use the term organisation loosely, quite often it is just a volunteer doing this in their spare time. Uh, they are the organisations that will organise data for a specific taxonomic group at a national level. Um, I mentioned county recorders. County recorders will focus on a specific taxonomic group within a specific county. So, for example, you might have a specific county recorder for dragonflies in Buckinghamshire. And county recorders will quite often work with, they'll be, they'll be affiliated with the National Recording Scheme and feed into that. However, there are many national recording schemes and societies that do not have a network of current recorders because they're just not that well established and they don't have the capacity. The recording scheme that I run is a good example of that. The National Airphone Recording Scheme is just me. Um, it's just me that's managing the data. So all records from all over the UK and Ireland and Channel Islands come to me. And it's really important that these organizations get this data for contextualizing the data 
with regards to the species group. Um, and then the final group I've got here are projects and specific projects and citizen science surveys. So, for example, any of you that have done the big garden bird watch with the RSPB, that data wouldn't be sent to any of those previous groups because it's part of a specific survey. So it goes to the survey organisers. The example I've got here is Project Splatter, which is about mapping roadkill in the UK. And if you're gathering data for a specific survey, then it should go to it should go to that survey. The hope is that all of these organisations share data with each other, but doing that can be quite tricky. Some are better at it than others, and some have very little capacity to do it. So you should always check with the relevant group or organisation about how they share their data, who it goes to. It's up to you where you submit your data. And although duplication of data can be a problem, if you know that the Local Environment Records Centre and the National Recording Scheme are not able to share data, you can send it to both. So, if you want to share your data with the Buckinghamshire Milton Keynes Environmental Records Centre, on their website, there's a submit your records page where you can go to and see uh, how to submit data. They've got a number of um, spreadsheets that you can fill in and send in data. Like I said, they work with county recorders. Uh, but some of those county recorders will have specific preferences for their groups. So if you, for example, are going to focus on recording butterflies, it would be advisable to get in touch with the county recorder for butterflies and ask them what their preferred method is. Uh, and they'll be the ones making sure that the record centre get it in those cases. Uh, it might be that Buckinghamshire Milton Keynes Environment Records Centre in some cases actually advise you to go direct to um, an online recording system called I record because that might be how the national scheme get it and then the record center can get it as well. So how does how does data flow? I'm going to go through this very quickly, don't worry. Um, the record starts with an observation, but it doesn't actually become a biological record until that is written down or typed in somewhere. So as long as it's in your mind, it's not an official biological record yet. The second pen meets paper or, you, or you've typed it in somewhere, it becomes a biological record. But at this point, it's no use to anybody because nobody can access it. So the key thing here that we want to get across in this webinar today is submission is really important. It's really important that you submit your records. And you can do that through iRecord or through the other methods that I mentioned earlier. Um, there are then a couple of processes to make sure that the record is suitable for acceptance. And those two processes are validation and verification. Uh, in online recording systems like iRecord, validation is automatic. So it won't let you put in a grid reference with an odd number of digits because that is not a valid grid reference. The number of Eastings much mass, uh, match the number of Northings. Uh, it won't let you put in a date in the wrong format. So if you if you try to put in, um, you know, if you don't put it in in the standard format, then it won't accept it. It won't accept sign. It won't accept species names that aren't accepted. So, as well. So it validates all of that. Verification is when somebody is checking that your record is correct, and usually that is two components: the geo reference and so the, the where and the species identification, so the, the what. And that might be uh, asking questions about your experience or it might be checking photos, it might be cross-referencing a location name, a site name with a grid reference. Uh, a very common thing <laughs> that I, I've seen in a previous job was back records. Uh, roost records in houses that were in the middle of the North Sea. And that's to do with getting a grid reference wrong. And like I said, we'll go through that in more detail in the next webinar. And then finally, uh, from there, the record is collated into data sets and then hopefully disseminated. Um, and uh, I won't go into any more detail about that for now. So iRecord is an online recording tool that I mentioned. It's, it's essentially a website for submitting, verifying, and sharing wildlife observations. 
including associated media such as photos. So one advantage of using online systems like this is you can attach photos to individual records, which is obviously not as easy to do with um, spreadsheets, etc. It's also available as an app. Personally, the, the app is quite basic. The app is good if you see, for example, a red squirrel, you snap a photo of it and you want to submit straight away. I would be very wary of the location data, um, as with all mobile devices, and I'll go through that in more detail um, in the next webinar. Um, any, as long as you, you're logging in with the same account, the records that you submitted through the app will be available on the website, but not vice versa. So it's primarily a website, and it, its main strength is that a, for a lot of recording groups, there are national experts checking the data. So it gives organisations like local environment record centres a free verification service with national experts that they wouldn't normally have access to. And it's free to use. You just need to uh, sign up with an account. And I've got plenty of videos and guidance on this on my website and, and on YouTube that I can share afterwards as well. In fact, my videos are on the um, iRecord website under the under the help section. Right, so I just want to round off with going back to the four main components of the biological record and doing a bit of a sense check. Does your record make sense? So what would happen if you omit this data? So if you omit the who data, oh, the who, what, where, when, if you omit the who data, then how can we know, uh, how can we, check or rectify potential mistakes with the record so if you've if you've accidentally put in, uh, got the grid reference wrong for example we're not able to go back and check that with you um, without knowing who it is we have no knowledge of the experience level of the recorder so this is particularly important for things that are not I, where there's no photo that can enable us to verify the record or the other photos not suitable enough to verify the record and it makes it difficult to ask further questions if there's nobody to get in touch with. We don't know who it was. What happens if they know what? Well, that means we've got a species occurrence record with no species. So if we've got no, there's no biodiversity in that biodiversity record. It's just a record of a person at a place at a specific time. So I think that's quite obvious. If there's no where, it means that when we're looking at that record, we're unable to comment on distributions of species presence, which is really important, obviously, it's a core part of the biological record. And no when means that we're unable to compare data within seasons or weather, and we're not able to look at changes over time. So, yeah, again, we've got no context. Right, okay. Um, before I end, I've got a little bit of homework for you all. I like everybody to try and submit five species records from your garden by the end of Sunday. So obviously we haven't charged anything for this webinar, it's free guidance. So in return, five records from your garden by the end of Sunday. Uh, and make sure that you're booked on the second webinar. Um, that brings us to the end of this, the, the, the presentation part. Let me 